We are joined today by three former Santana High School students who were students when the shooting happened in 2001. We have Lauren Gaines, Phil Ortiz, and Kristen Dare. Thank you so much for being with us here today. I want to talk about what brings us here, and that is the shooter, Andy Williams, is going to be up for parole in March of 2024. Uh, Our producer, Dorian Hargrove, yes, Dorian. discovered that this mm -hmm. was happening. Were you surprised? I was, in fact. Uh, so, you know, I had gotten a phone call from him and we were able to, to discuss it a little bit. I think that he had found some information online about me and we had just gone through a 20 year anniversary of the shooting. So I think a lot of the, the limelight was kind of back on the situation. You know, it's something that was brought back to the surface. A lot of people try to suppress these things and not discuss it and let it be part of your everyday life. And um, with the 20 year approaching, I had written an article um, from a community standpoint as we were trying to raise some awareness to go in a more positive direction 20 years later. But it was our producer who told you yes. that Williams is going to have an opportunity at parole after only 25 years. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah, it was in fact your team who reached out to me and, and that was my first time uh, being made aware of it. And what went through your mind when you heard that? Um, you know, immediately I'd say I just, it, it took over a, a part of me that we, we try to push away, you know, you try not to feel like the kid you were the day of the shooting, but I think anytime these things come up, that's automatically what happens. I feel like that 16 year old little girl again, who had never had anything bad happen and didn't really know how to react to things. And emotionally, it takes you into that headspace a little bit. So. I think the 16 year old me thought how unfair that was going to be on so many levels. And I just immediately thought of the boys who aren't here with us anymore, who lost their lives that day, that don't get this opportunity for making those decisions for their lives. Because last you heard, it was going to be 50 years minimum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and once Kristen found out about it, she texted me mm -hmm. and I mean, after that, everybody in the community started calling and texting each other. It spread like wildfire. And that's really how our community is, very tight knit um, because of what we went through. What were the texts? Can you believe it? Have you heard? The majority of them are, this can't happen. It's only been 20 years. And, um, you know, we're all parents now. And so to Kristen's point, you do go into that headspace of who you were in that moment and all those memories, I mean, you can remember every step you took that day, subsequently everything that happened like it was yesterday. And then once that passes, then you move into the headspace of being a, a father or a mother. And then there's another um, aspect of torment that goes through your head of, um, gosh, what, what is that like? Um, and so being that in that headspace, coming from different angles, um, it automatically made me think, you know, I called Kristen and said, we have to do something. Um, and so we kind of brainstormed and, and put together a letter um, uh, to, because there was so much outpouring of support from our perspective that he can't get out that early. Lauren, did you feel the same way? How can this happen? Absolutely. Uh, Kristen had shared the letter with me and I was so thankful that they had put it together because it's, it's an atrocity to imagine him out um, in such a short time. I haven't healed from what had happened. And Do you think you will ever heal? And you look at this parole opportunity from your teenage selves, but Phil, as you mentioned, also from your parental selves, and I imagine that you're putting yourself in the shoes of those boys' parents now. I, I think I put myself in the shoes of the boys' parents almost immediately somehow still. I mean, I would go every year on the anniversary, you know, they would do vigils at the school site and um, I would always go at nighttime, light candles, say prayers, even pray for Andy to be really honest with you, um, you know, that he would really recognize and, and be regretful for all of the things that he has done. and. Um, you know, it, it is, it, it's, it's just so different as a parent. You're right, it, it, it's all these layers now that come with it. And um, 
I, I have a little bit older children than Phil and Lauren, but you know, we, we have had a child in high school and I have my next child getting geared up for that as an eighth grader now. So, you know, with us still all living in and around the community, you have to think about where you're gonna place your child and putting them back onto a campus that is forever haunting for you and being able to differentiate, you know, your trauma from what could be their experience is, is very odd. Uh, I feel the emotion from you and you share that bond and will share it forever along with everyone else who was there that day. Lauren, where were you when you heard the shots or you heard about <coughs> there being a shooting? So I, it was my 16th birthday and <laughs> I had just been dropped off at the front of the school and I was walking with my best friend and telling her about all the birthday celebrations we had done over the weekend. And I heard what sounded like firecrackers going off. And being in high school, you don't think much of it. So we continued walking. And then I saw Andy come out of the bathroom and I was on my way to a theater class that he was in. So I recognized his backpack and his sweatshirt and I just saw his body turn his back to me and go in one motion and then go back. And then it was a flood of people. And my girlfriend and I grabbed each other and everyone kind of stampeded around us and teachers were yelling at us to come into class. And by the time we realized it, we were one of the last ones in the hallway. So we ran out of the school and ran across the street to the postal annex and I immediately called my dad. <laughs> and he kind of blacked out and didn't even remember talking to me. He just put the phone down and ran to the parking lot as quickly as he could. My mom turned around and, and came back to the parking lot and that's where we stayed, just waiting to see who came out. Did Andy continue to fire as he Yes, he, he continued to fire and he walked towards the, towards the large quad. I was kind of halfway in the hallway in the small quad. And so that's when he walked towards the larger quad. Um, he had already hit people in the hallway in the small quad in the bathroom. And then he walked towards the large quad away from us. So we were really lucky. If I had been on time that day, I would have been in the large quad right where he was walking towards. So. I'm thankful for being late for once. <laughs> Phil, where were you? <clears throat> um, I actually wasn't that far away from Lauren. I was in the large quad and I was walking. I haven't talked about this in a long time. <laughs> um, I was in the large quad and I was walking west to the um, small quad, where directly towards where Andy was coming out. And my classroom was directly across the hallway from where he came out. And um, by, I don't know, the grace of God or something, one of my friends hollered at me to, to come back for some reason. And when I walked away from my classroom, I was halfway in that hallway. And then, like Lauren said, the first time you hear gunshots, it sounds a lot like firecrackers. And so the panic doesn't set in, it's more mm -hmm. confusion. And then you just see people running in different directions, which adds to more confusion. And then eventually um, you, you get a semblance of what's happening. And um, I, at that point, someone grabbed me by my backpack, the back of my backpack and yanked me. Uh, so I don't know who that was. It wasn't my friend. And I just remember running to the back of the school and it was spotty in my memory. At, I think I might have just don't remember or blacked out, but I remember being in the back of the parking lot and I just jumped into some random person's truck, the back of their truck, along with I think four or five other people. I didn't know who he was, who was driving, and that's what everyone was doing, just random, jumping into random cars. And I think someone flipped their car coming out of the parking lot, so it was just mm -hmm. chaotic. I almost got hit by another car running through the parking lot. And then we just drove two or three streets out of the way and then just went into some random person's house. And 
the the woman there had the presence of mind to start filtering kids in and say you need to start calling someone right now and then shortly after that all the sirens in east county started blaring you knew uh that there was a shoot that andy was shooting though at that point oh yeah yeah it was it was obvious when um you see things um yeah that yeah people were getting shot yeah you could see the terror in people's faces that's how you knew because they were they were running for their lives i think i had a slower delay to it all to be really honest with you um i know i did M my i have a, older siblings who were also students and had graduated at that point mm -hmm. so um, my brother had participated the year prior when he was a senior at Santana in a program that I don't know if it still exists called every 15 minutes mm -hmm. and it's a statistic about drunk drivers and that every 15 minutes somebody dies from drunk driving so they did a program at Santana the year prior to really have it hit home for the students that this can have you know really large implications and my brother was a participant in that program so I was let in on it because they wanted to have students walk around campus appearing to be dead, in fact. So I don't know if you remember this. I you do. you would have yeah. you guys would have been sophomores. Mm -hmm. It was my no, freshmen. Freshman. I was a sophomore, my brother was a senior. So I was told about it in advance so that because they do a full program with law enforcement where they even come to your home and reenact in fact what it would look like if uh, a law enforcement officer had to go to a home and tell a parent that their child had passed away from a drunk driving experience and the school didn't want me to hear rumors that my brother had passed away and think that it was true because of the nature of the program so I knew about it in advance so as the day went on you know I wasn't going to be surprised so fast forward to the next school year my brother had graduated and I was a junior so I thought that what I was seeing was in fact a simulation of something because I thought it was another program that they were trying to raise awareness on and I thought oh I'm not a senior so I didn't hear about it and or get invited to participate in the program so I started walking from the small quad um, across toward the shooter to get a closer look, thinking that I was, was watching an, a reenactment an or, or an exercise of, a, of some kind of program. So I was a little bit slower to gain that perspective that it was in fact real. That's so, chilling that you walked toward the activity. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't until I saw the campus supervisor who was injured, Peter, mm -hmm. who fell down, he was shot and he had, mm -hmm, he had he had gotten on the ground and in the middle of that smaller quad there's an entrance to the school library and he was physically trying to shoo kids and push them into to get into the library and you know as While I was thinking was on the ground oh yeah and as I approached him and got closer the, the school colors are purple and gold and they wore purple polo shirts if you remember the and I, when I got closer, I could see that the purple, in fact, was starting to fill up with the blood from the shooting from his back. And when I saw that it was blood soaked, um, was right around the same time that I think my friend next to me realized the same thing. And you know, all of a sudden, it dawned on us this wasn't any kind of, you know, reenactment of any sort. So it, it took an extra minute, I'd say, for me. I'd and the three of you, what strikes me are just three of the, what was the student body at the time? About 1,800 you know? students total, three I think. Three stories of 1,800 who were there that have experienced, um, and I can tell as you're reliving it that it, it's still, the pain is still very deep. Um, and as Lauren, you mentioned, it, we probably will never, ever, ever heal. Um, you move on and you try to find ways to help. You move forward and um, yeah, I mean, I think we all definitely have our day-to-day -day struggles and I, and I know they vary, you know, I, we, we're all still connected with many people who were students and um, I think as we got older, we realized what a ripple effect it had, not on just the students on campus from that time, but really outwardly to our families who were, were really trying to counsel us through something that they couldn't fully understand or, or really resonate with. Um, you know, staff members, the entire Grossmont Union district at that, mm -hmm. at that point probably was so impacted. The Santana staff, I mean, how many stories did we hear about with staff members who 
couldn't return to campus, who didn't mm -hmm. return, who had students die in their arms. Mm -hmm. It was just um, beyond us that were just there that day. And, you know, our, our friends, our neighbors, um, our priest, Father Mike, was one Father of the Mike first people to call. Campus. Yep, and yeah. go on campus and just help. So it, it went so far outwardly, you know, as those 15, 16, 17 year old kids, I think we were really looking at it um, from an isolated perspective. But as we've gotten older, I think we really have got a broader understanding of, of how wide the reach was for something like this. So, you know, you prepare for the one year mark, the five year, 10 year, 15, 20 year mark. This is not a story about a milestone or an anniversary. Now we're approaching March 2024. This is a story about the shooter um, 22, 23 years later, mm -hmm. having an opportunity to plea for parole. Mm -hmm. You've just taken me back to all those years ago where the memories are so vivid and for you and also this whole community. Um, how do you feel about this law in California that requires people who are incarcerated when they're still teenagers an opportunity to plead for parole after 25 years? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, even going back to this, there, there was a chance that Andy could have been tried as a juvenile. You know, he was 15 when he committed this crime. Um, we, we were all on pins and needles to see even at that time you know, could he and would he be tried as an adult? And mm -hmm. honestly, I, I think there was a little bit of uh, a sigh of relief that he was being tried as an adult. We felt like he made an incredibly adult decision that day and that he needed to be held accountable. And, you know, we're watching and waiting and anticipating his arraignment, you know, again, grateful that he pled guilty so we didn't have to go through the heartache and watch a trial and all the things that could have come from that. So, you know, I, I felt even at 16 years old that I had strong opinions about where that was all landing. So even now as, you know, in my late 30s, I, I, I feel pretty similarly, honestly. This, it doesn't seem right. It, you know, I think Phil, you and I kind of talked a little bit about what, what, is, what would this mean outwardly if this changes, right? Yeah. Not just for us. No, well, outside of what it would mean for Randy and Brian's family, who they don't have their sons or brothers anymore, um, on a larger perspective, when I think about what's fair and what's just in our criminal justice system, the image that comes to mind is the statue of the lady that has the blindfold and the scales. And so what's the symbolism behind that is a blindfold means that justice is blind. It doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, the law is going to treat you equally. And then the scales mean that the law is going to treat you and justice is going to treat you fairly. Everybody involved in the incident is going to be treated fairly and equally. And if Andy is released early, then those scales are going to tip in his favor. I mean, after 20 years, R Randy and Brian don't get to come back from the dead. I mean, the psychological effects just don't magically wipe away after 20 years. And so people have to be held accountable for their actions. And the more we move away from that, it's going to undermine everything that we've worked for in, in our community for stability and justice and moral results. And I mean, I know that people are going to take advantage of this law. I mean, gang members are going to prey upon other young men to say, hey, you go do the dirty work for me. If I go kill this person, I'm going to be in for the rest of my life. But if you go do it, you'll be out when you're 30. So it's setting a dangerous precedent for other would-be mass shooters that um, is going to have, it's going to create more victims and psychological effects from years and years to come. And um, we just, we can't have it. We have to remember why we have these principles and and these this criminal justice system that has worked and um, it, it's it's not moral to do that. Supporters of this law argue that well, one, California's prisons are overcrowded, and two, when you are that age, 14, 15, 16, uh, when you're not a legal adult at 18, your brain is not fully formed, and. I read a statistic that said the recidivism rate for people who have been allowed to be released 
early mm. after 25 years is one one or two percent. So supporters of this law say that offenders who are this young deserve a second chance because they were perhaps too young to know what they were doing at the time. Lauren, what do you think about that argument? Um, at 16 years old, I, I know he was just a year younger than I, but at, at that age, you know when you're taking a life. You know what you're doing. Um, yes, your brain not, may not be fully functioning. Um, I, that's not an excuse to take another life, um, to traumatize an entire community, to steal other children's childhood away from them. You do don't you, get a hall pass for that. Do you feel like your childhood was stolen from you in ways? I do, and I feel overly protective of my children. I tell them every time they get out of the car how much I love them because I want that to be the last thing that they hear from me. And I think about sending them to school every day, worried that something's going to happen to them. And that will never go away. So the idea of him being released early, it's just, um, it's not fair. I think those emotions even come up. Lauren, I've had conversations with you with, uh, you know, our kids being on campuses and, and even something totally unrelated to gun violence, but you hear a siren go off and it goes up the street and you know it's going the direction of your child's school, it, it strikes a chord in you. You know, uh, there's a lockdown situation at school because of something, maybe even a pipe bursting on campus. It strikes a chord through you. It still reignites, I think, a lot of these emotions that we have. And, you know, I hate using something so common as PTSD, but that's what it is. Mm -hmm. We all have it, and it all sits with us, right, in different ways. Yeah, to your point, I remember being paranoid whenever you'd go into a public place for so long. I mean, Still. Never it, with your back to a door. Yeah, that's exactly Still. what I was gonna say. And so these, are, I mean, mm -hmm. the stress levels that go through you, I mean, as a young kid, but then moving in, even to adulthood, it shapes the, who you are and the way your brain functions. And your brain, brain can play tricks and say, okay, going through scenarios in your head, if someone were to come in, where would I hide? Mm -hmm. Okay, if someone were to come in through this door, where would I get out, you know? And so you, you walk into a room and there's no exit except for this mm -hmm. one right here. I mean, I we have one yep, over there. Okay, oh, no, we yeah. have. <laughs> <laughs> but my mind, no, but that's how you involuntarily, think. my mind yes. just kind of goes through that, and it's okay. Yeah. All right, I think I'm trapped here. Yeah. You know, so to your point, mm -hmm. the psychological effects, you know, they subside maybe a little bit, but they're always there. But they, they, yeah. I mean, they they can flare up on the smallest things. You know, so Dorian was kind enough, honestly, to to alert me to this story, right? And Phil and I then have some conversations and, you know, we say, okay, w we can't just sit by and let this happen, so what can we do? So we write a letter to the community, we start an online petition mm -hmm. to get people who would like to also support the denial of his potential early release, and we all start kind of signing on. And, and as I put it out on Facebook day one, um, and just kind of not knowing where it's going to go or what it's going to do, just having the conversation with you on and off. You know, we're, we're tailoring a letter all day. We're talking about who, who do we get this out to, who do we include, and just, just thinking about it. I mean, I had a nightmare that night. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask to have a bad dream, you know, and, and so that's where you're talking about these involuntary things that still happen to you. I still have n nightmares that, you know, I, I can't just push them away, it just kind of happens, just by having conversations. Right. Nothing traumatic happened to me that day, you know, it was awesome, I got to talk to an old friend, but just having this kind of come back to the forefront of your mind, it, it, it just brings all these other things to the surface again. And I, I, I do, I don't think I've told anyone this, but I do want to say that there is some duality in me, where there's a side of me that says, man, I wish I could have known Andy and put my arm around him and say, dude, like, don't worry about those guys, they're dumb, you know, come with me. So there's definitely duality in me in wishing, you know, being a father now, you know, and seeing a young kid get and as he's shared his story, he talks about being the, bullied. The being bullied yeah. and sexually assaulted and totally. 
the trauma that he had in his own life. Yeah, and you know, we've I've been bullied. You know, I've been beat up um, when I was a kid, and so um, so I kind of I grew up in the same place that he did. You know, so um, so there's duality in me in that. You know, I do. There is a, a small side of me that says, "Man, I wish I could have been there for this kid." And the other side is, "Well, you know, you, you, you chose your action." And I think to go back, I think one of the big things, maybe the judge or someone was saying, was that he reloaded. Mm -hmm. um, and I think con going in and out of the bathroom multiple times, mm -hmm. consciously, was one of the pieces of evidence that they chose to try him as an adult, whereas you know someone else would have oh my gosh, like, what, what am I doing, you know, and then stop. Um, so I think that was one of the reasons um, that he was tried as an adult. But all that to say, yeah, um, the scholarship that we, we all helped raise for the Rotary, um, and kudos to the Lakeside Santee Rotary for doing it for so many years. In it, honor of the two. In honor of uh, Brian, Brian. Zug, yeah, Brian and Randy. Randy. Um, Kudos to them, they give it to two high school seniors, $1,000 each, um, and they talk about bullying, they talk about violence, and how to combat that, and what to do, and how to confront it. And um, So they're making a difference, and it's um, that, that, that's what I think we need to take from it. I think that's where we tried to go as adults, you know, 20 years ago, or excuse me, at the 20th anniversary. Um, you know, that, that was a big milestone and, and a time for us all to reflect, where are we now? And Andy being in prison or being released from that wasn't even really oh, on my yeah. mind. You know, yeah. that I, I didn't even think about an early release at that time. But as the 20th anniversary approached, we're lucky enough to have relationships with uh, people who, who are in and actively involved with the Santee Lakeside Rotary Club. and. I knew that some of the funds were kind of getting low in that pot and and as it you know a community starts to heal and and move on uh, you just don't forget and we promised never to and I think a lot of us students really promised each other that we would always speak their names and let those boys live on the best way we knew how and we really felt like this scholarship was an appropriate way that was really highlighting anti-bullying efforts and peace efforts around campus mm -hmm. so um, you know at the 20th anniversary I started an online campaign mm -hmm. to to really ask for people who were students possibly at that time or impacted as community members and now we're all well off in our careers and to say on to adult lives and say yeah maybe, yeah maybe we can maybe now that we're all adults and, and kind of on our own paths we can take a little bit of that income of ours and and put it towards something that that has a purpose versus just us hurting year after year as the anniversary approaches right so it felt really great to do that and raise some money and Phil had a really amazing idea too to keep that going this following year where we had combined class high school reunions for the class of 2002 and then 2003 mm -hmm. and he and a few other key students really put together some amazing efforts to continue raise funds so I think that in our lifetime at least we're, we're gonna see that continue so that we can keep speaking their names and we're actually presenting the check to Rotary tomorrow in the amount of seven thousand dollars that's great yeah. I do want to talk about online efforts uh, let's move back toward the petition mm. since this is where we want to focus our attention on um, are your efforts to try to make people aware of what's happening mm -hmm not perhaps influence them to make a decision or not, but if they do agree with you to sign this petition, what do you hope to do with this? Yeah, I, I think that making people aware, for Kristen's point, we were unaware that this even was coming up. And so, number one, inform. And then two, make sure if you are against Andy getting out that your voice is heard. And so doing interviews like this and circulating on social media is the best way to get our word out and then send it to the parole board and show the impact that it still has um, and send it to other elected officials around the area that are still in, that maybe were there during the shooting and are still around in show of support. Um, because um, if, if our voices aren't heard, the victims' voices aren't heard, then um, that's not a balanced approach. Yeah, and I think that was really the conversation Phil and I had. You know, he said, 
I, I know I'm going to draft this letter. Do you, do you want to, you know, co-author it with me, so to speak? And I said, absolutely. And then we said, maybe we should get other classmates of ours from, from the time we were on school to sign and, and, you know, put some more weight behind it. And then we kind of kept growing from there. And I thought, well, why, why just stop there? And so we actually, with the petition, you kind of identify what what your placement was in our community at that time. So were you a student? Were you staff? Were you friends and family of a student? Or or were you really just, you know, are you Santana alumni and that really struck a chord with you personally or we, more? We will continue to follow your efforts uh, in the coming months before the March 2024 parole hearing. But I do want to just ask, um, Andy has shared uh, some of his story with us, with our producer, Dorian. Do you feel that Andy's side of the story um, should be heard at this point. He's had a lot of time to reflect, 20 some years behind bars. Do you think that makes a difference? Uh, I, I'd like to think that if he's reflecting on his actions and it would be nice to hear, but that will never change what happened. And justice is justice and he needs to live out his term so that we have some peace of mind that this won't happen to our children um, i am interested to hear what he has to say but i don't think that it would change how i feel about him phil yeah, I absolutely believe he should be able to speak his mind and have a voice. Um, but I agree with Lauren. I mean, we, he made a choice, and we have to be, you know, we have to live with our choices. Everyone has to live with their choices. We have autonomy, you know, over our, over our choices. And so it wouldn't, whatever he says, you know, I, I don't know that it would change my mind either. And Kristen, so after 50 years, I mean, 50 years, if that was the term, then, I mean, I can't have much argument at that point, but right now I think that we deserve to have our voice heard in the matter, and we aren't in favor of it. And he can share his story, but that shouldn't change his term. Sure, I'd, I mean, he can share his story, absolutely, and, and, and honestly, maybe that would be helpful for everyone. Everyone's impact is different, and, mm -hmm. and the way we approach healing is always different, and so I think it could possibly be helpful for some of the victims to hear his words and, and where he is all these years later. So I think that there's always a space for that, and people can choose to decide if that would be helpful or not for them. I want to thank you. Um, because when this first happened, the media was ferocious at us. <laughs> I mean, I, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. yep. The media was absolutely like bloodthirsty to get a camera and a microphone. And I remember the majority of the people that were adults around us were co coaching us about the media, not about what happened, but how to deal with the media. Mm -hmm. um, the whole front of the school was shut down and you have been extremely um, poised and gracious and kind. And, and that has been a, a reversal from, I think, what we all experienced our 100%. first time. Mm -hmm. So 100%. thank you very much for yep. being co courteous about all of Agree. it. Agree, and that extends outwardly. Um, you know, Dorian sitting in the background think, over yes. here, and, and mm -hmm. he was so kind in his approach and mindful and um, above and beyond appropriate, and, ex and placing you here was part of that extension of his, his kindness. Our executive producer, Dorian, has done a lot of work, and we did not, as a station, want to put this on our main newscast to kind of, you know, you have to watch this today. You're watching the news and this is what you have to watch. We put it on our digital website so that people who wanted the information could go there and read it for themselves because we know even 20 some years later is a very sensitive subject. Mm -hmm. I get chills just listening uh, to you share your accounts. And so we want to be part of the healing. We want to be part of the conversation because I am a parent of two seniors in high school. So I share the same worries that you do when I send them to school. And um, we can't stop talking about it because it's the reality that we live in so many years later. Mm -hmm. But we have to talk about it because it is the reality that we live in so many years later. So I just want to thank the three of you yeah. for opening up your uh, headspace, your hearts to come here and, and share how the impact has been on you over the last 22 years. Yeah. And um, 
Thank and you. we'll continue to follow the story and see um, what happens. But thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Marcella. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.